Anjali Ben Pandya, who who uh, who was one of the tallest leaders of uh, American Hindu community uh, and VHP America. She battled cancer for last three years. Her contribution to VHP right from its inception is immeasurable. Anjali Ben's life is an inspiration to anyone facing hardship in life. I met her once in 2003 at the Global Dharma Conference. Night and day, working tirelessly for Hindu cause. It didn't really matter what the what the project was. It didn't really matter what the task was. Our heartfelt condolences to Anjali Ben. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste Utsada and good morning. Welcome to Hindu Lounge. Namaste Ajay Bhai and welcome to Hindu Lounge number 55. That's right Utsada. For those people who are joining us for the first time, this is Hindu Lounge. Hindu Lounge is a weekly live show uh, brought to you by Hindu Pack, which is the advocacy and policy research initiative of World Hindu Council of America, VHPA. We come live every Sunday at 11 o'clock Eastern on all our channels, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and also Twitter. And a few days later, we are on Tag TV. Uh, we are, we, this is a call-in show. I will post the you know ways you can reach us and participate in the show. And we talk about contemporary American Hindu issues. Uh, I am Ajay Shah. I am the president of World Hindu Council of America. And with me, as always, is Utsal Chakrabarti. Utsalda is the executive director of Hindu Pact. And Utsada, with that, uh, welcome to the show. We have, uh, uh, you know, a couple of uh, couple of topics for today, and the first one is somewhat of a somber one. Um, Anjali Ben Pandya's passing, and we'll do a tribute to Anjali Ben. Um, we'll do a much fuller tribute later on. Uh, today, we'll just basically make the announcement and a brief remembrance, and then we will do a more elaborate uh, tribute to this unique, one of a kind Hindu leader in America. And then we will talk about so that toolkits and how the uh, toolkit, uh, this particular one, uh, you know, created by the Congress in India regarding COVID, how it is impacting Hindus in America. So, so that with that, I turn it over to you and to welcome our uh, our guests. And then once you're done, we will start with our tribute to Anjali Ben. Thank you, Ajay Bhai, and welcome everybody. Um, it is important to understand that uh, you know the discussion on the latest toolkit, as we call it nowadays, you know, much maligned word uh, that is coming from the opposition, the main opposition party in India. This discussion didn't start here. It's 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 part of a bigger conversation that we will touch upon when we start today on on manufactured grassroots movements. So these movements look like grassroots movements, but they're actually manufactured from top down. And you know, it started with uh, it became much public uh, with the Greta Thunberg toolkit. So we'll get into that today, and then obviously we'll talk about the latest uh, toolkit activism that Ajay mentioned. But before that, uh, Ajay, I would like you to talk about uh, Anjali Ben Pandya, who who uh, who was one of the tallest leaders of uh, American Hindu community uh, and. VHP America. So the, I am going to uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, you please let me know when you see it. Um, I see it. Yes. This is uh, you know I you know I had a fortune of meeting Anjali Ben in 1984 um, when there was a, a Hindu conference that was organized by uh, VHPA in uh, New York City. Uh, it was the largest Hindu conference to date. And that was the first VHPA event that I I attended, um, and I got to meet uh, you know the stalwarts of the Hindu movement in America, and among them was Anjali Ben. And I, through the years, I I saw Anjali Ben um, work for the Hindu cause tirelessly. Uh, she was a you know a volunteer, a full time volunteer of. Uh, you know, a uh, full-time volunteer of VHPA. Uh, she uh, was unpaid, uh, but she dedicated decades, decades, so that decades of her life. Um, I think since uh, she was 23, 24 years old, till she passed away at the age of 70, 
last year and uh, I'm sorry, last week, uh, she wo- she worked tirelessly for Hindu cause. Um, she moved back to India about 10 years ago, but even then she did the work for uh, as a liaison between, uh, you know, uh, BHP America and organizations in India. So there was the, this, uh, you know, there was no task that was too small. There was no task that was too big. I remember we did 1993 Berlin, uh, you know, uh, conference, uh, the, the Hindu conference, the, uh, in the memory of Swami Vivekananda Global Hindu Conference, uh, in the mem- in the 100th anniversary of Swami Vivekananda's speech to the Parliament of Religion. And Anjali Ben was, I remember, still remember her sitting on the floor in Washington, D.C., in a room where she had probably spent months, if not a whole year, just in that one place, working night and day, making sure that people were contacted, the organizing committees were formed, uh, the you know the uh, minutest details related to whether it was the conference arena, whether it was food, whether it was guests that were coming from all over the world, all of that. And then you go back and uh, you know you go to a smaller meeting and Anjali Ben is there singing a bhav geet. And then you get to Diwali at, and Anjali Ben has sent you a Diwali greeting card and. And uh, in between, uh, she has gone and met uh, probably, uh, you know, the king of Thailand or gone and met, uh, uh, gone and organized the conference somewhere else. It is just night and day working tirelessly for Hindu cause. It didn't really matter what the what the project was. It didn't really matter what the task was. It didn't matter whether it was meeting the king of Thailand or the or Nelson Mandela in South Africa or meeting with a karyakarta who has not even joined VHPA yet or who is a kid who is 10 years old or 12 years old. And working like that for Hindu cause, for Hindu unity, uh, you know, working with uh, the Hindu leaders in Bharat, whether it is, you know, someone like uh, Manya Si Ashok, uh, Ashok Singhalji, or whether it is working with some, uh, you know, uh, as a, 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 a someone who has participated in the Ram Janmai movement, a Kar Sevak. It didn't really matter what. It is the, you know, with the same kind of Shraddha, with the same kind of Atmiyata, with the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the, you know, the acceptance of all, dedicate, you know, understanding of all, with all, you know, I, I just don't have enough words so that to explain uh, at a personal level what kind of interaction she had. So, so that what I thought was, I will, uh, you know, I will read, um, I will read a, pre- a press release that was drafted by uh, our own uh, Gaurang Bhai Vaishnav, who uh, also been, uh, knew Anjali Ben for a very long time. And so I'm going to read that uh, press release, which summarizes the life work of Anjali Ben Pandya to some extent. As I said, this is just a uh, remembrance we will do a much more uh, elaborate uh, you know a memorial a fitting memorial for Anjali Ben when the time comes so um, the press release and I, I you be, usually we don't read a whole page but this particular one we we absolutely have to so Vishwanath Parishad of America regretfully announces the passing away passing away of Anjali Ben Pandya its director of international liaison uh, on 19th of May at Gandhinagar, Gujarat, at the age of 70. She battled cancer for last three years. Anjali Ben Shah served Vishwanthu Parishad of America and the Hindu community of America in various capacities, including as its general secretary and also as full-time unpaid volunteer for many decades. Her contribution to VHPA right from its inception is immeasurable. Anjali Ben's life is an inspiration to anyone facing hardship in life. She was widowed at the age of 24 with a two-year-old baby and being in the U.S. for only three years, she faced many challenges. From the docile young lady, she became powerhouse of energy, seva and samarpan. She dedicated her life to the Hindu society, not only in the U.S., but across the world. Anjali Ben started as a volunteer graphics and layout artist and a typesetter for VHPA's magazine, The Hindu Vishwa. Soon, she developed confidence and her horizon expanded to include understanding of the issues of the Hindu society in the US and management of growing organization. She was the moving force behind VHPA's major, major conferences in 1984 and 1993, Dharma Samsad, Dharma Prasar Yatra, 
hosting more than 100 Hindu saints and dignitaries for the United Nations Millennium Peace Summit, several Hindu Mandir executive conferences, etc. She excelled in working with the children and youth in the youth camps. To the campers, she was a mother. To the volunteers, she was a loving sister. She took active part in fighting Mrs. Gandhi's emergency and in Sri Ram Janmui movement. She traveled extensively to many countries where she was invited to help with the planning of major events. She was one of the key persons in managing South Africa's first World Hindu Congress in 1995 that drew more than 30,000 and was graced by the presence of Nelson Mandela and scores of saints and Swamiji's. Anjali Ben had the innate ability to work enthusiastically with all, from new volunteers to high and mighty. By sheer force of her dedication and sacrifices, she had earned the trust of her co-workers, religious heads, Swamiji's, and national leaders. She was as at ease with meeting with the kings and of Thailand as she was entering the residence of then Prime Minister Vajpayee. She handled with finesse a challenging task of convincing various religious leaders to sit together on VHPA's platform for the good of Hindu Samaj or society. Anjali Ben moved back to Bharat about 10 years back. While there, she became very active with Global Indians for Bharat Vikas, GIBV, a US-based NGO working for the rural empowerment and educating citizens of the responsibilities and rights. She served as its president in Bharat. Besides being an active volunteer, Anjali Ben was an artist. She was a good painter, decorator, and a versatile singer. She also authored a book in Gujarati detailing Hindu samskars and customs as observed in certain communities in Gujarat. She leaves behind a son, daughter, a daughter-in-law, two grandchildren, and thousands of admirers across the world. So the, this is what it means to be a Hindu karyakarta, a Hindu leader, a Hindu, a dedicated selfless Hindu volunteer. And uh, Anjali Ben epitomized all of that and a lot more. And for all those people who have ever said, that Hindu organizations are, you know, uh, predominantly male and run by men and all of that, they don't know anything about VHPA or Hindu organizations. Anjali Ben was not just the general secretary of World Hindu Council of America. She, without her, I can, I can unequivocally unequivocally state that VHPA would have been not even a fraction of what it is today. Every aspect of VHPA was touched and improved and made better by Anjali Ben. So our heartfelt condolences to Anjali Ben, a much more elaborate uh, memorial is Coming, we'll make an announcement uh, in next few days. But today, we just want to let everyone know that Anjali Ben Pandya, the pillar and the stalwart of World in the Council of America, is no more. And with that, Utsada, I request a, a moment of silence. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So the, I turn it over to you to introduce our next topic. Thank you, Ajay Bhai. And uh, thank you for that uh, detailed uh, tribute to Anjali Ben. I met her once in 2003 at the Global Dharma Conference. I was uh, designing an exhibition on uh, Hindu the history of Hindu Dharma and Hindu Dharma in general. And she was in charge of the overall uh, 
presentation of the entire uh, venue. Uh, so her son, uh, is, who is an architect, was also involved in the interior design of the venue. So I had a good opportunity to interact with her. And I saw firsthand much of the things that you, that you discussed today. So thank you for that beautiful and uh, detailed tribute. So moving on to our topic for discussion today, Ajay Bhai, uh, let's look at the toolkit activism and, and the recent Congress uh, toolkit. Congress, not in, as in American Congress, but the, the main opposition party in India, the Congress I, uh, and the toolkit activism that they came up with in the last weeks. Uh, but before we go there, let's discuss what's this toolkit activism. And you know, the word toolkit nowadays has taken a lot of uh, negative connotations, especially after Greta Thunberg's toolkit leaked out during the so-called uh, quote unquote farmers protest that was uh, very, very aggressively promoted in India by a certain section of the opposition parties and uh, quote unquote farmers. In, in Delhi that dis disrupted uh, public life in the national capital of India for a long period of time. It became a super spreader uh, gathering for months at length, uh, which probably led to a huge upsurge in COVID uh, wave, second wave in Delhi, the capital region of India, which was, which was going through a very, very sad and tragic uh, COVID upsurge. Weeks after this happened, uh, these protests happened. And of course, globally, including in America and Canada, uh, the participation of, uh, I would say, not so friendly organizations, including separatist uh, fundamentalist organizations uh, based in Canada and America in the so-called farmers protest, uh, their support to them, their funding to them, and obviously their messaging in support of the quote unquote farmers protest that happened. And all of that became public when a very, very popular quote unquote climate activist who is known to be, you know, very selectively a climate activist based on what geopolitical interests are being served at any given point of time, Greta Thunberg. And uh, she leaked a toolkit uh, that was online, that was used as a information, information disseminating tool for celebrities to target India and especially Indian Prime Minister Modi. So as many people who, who have been following these events would know, you know, it gave, the toolkit gave out information on many, many disruptive organizations, uh, including what, what is considered Khalistani, which is a separatist Sikh fundamentalist uh, movement, uh, very violent in its, in its uh, you know, heydays, extremely violent and supported by Pakistan. So, so a lot of things came out with the Greta Thunberg toolkit leak. And uh, fast forward, you know, a couple of months, and you have the same kind of activism that was coming out of uh, the Congress party, which is the main opposition party in India. Now, people need to know that this toolkit activism that we are talking about didn't start with the Greta Thunberg toolkit leak. leak. It started actually uh, much before that. It actually was being used, this entire template of you know, manufactured grassroots movements was used during the Arab Spring, which if, you know, people remember back in uh, 2010, 2011, was a movement that was you know, presented in the media uh, globally as this democratizing uh, movement emerging from the grassroots in the Middle East, you know, with youth you know, becoming westernized and then trying to topple uh, dictatorships to bring up democracy, e except that eventually it turned out that was not the case. And all these so-called youth were actually Muslim Brotherhood youth whose goal was to turn most Middle Eastern countries uh, into Islamic uh, theocratic uh, army states uh, or, you know, armed rebellions. And, uh, you know, it led to the rise of Al-Qaeda in Tunisia. It, was, it led to the rise of Al-Qaeda and the persistence of Al-Qaeda in Libya today. Libya is now a complete, very violent country with slavery in, in full force. It led to the rise of uh, ISIS in big areas of the Middle East. Nobody would have imagined that you know, even 20 years ago. 
that area like the Middle East with so many military powers, with so much interest, with so much resources in control of that area, giving up a size of land that, which is bigger than you know, most countries in Europe to a, a Islamic caliphate, which was based on like sixth century radical Islamic thoughts in the 21st century. But it happened because of this Arab Spring and the toolkit uh, uprisings that were engineered back in 2010. So ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the rise of the so-called Arab Spring Islamic rulers, you owe that to toolkit activism. So, so, so this is just to give a background of you know, where this toolkit activism comes from. And I'm not saying that everything bad came out of it. There might, be, might have been something good that came out of it. But <clears throat> it's the trend of manufactured grassroots movements that is happening around the, country, around the world. And it has been now very thoroughly embraced by both opposition uh, elements and, and thought leaders in India, as well as global players who may or may not have India's best interests in mind. And as you saw with Greta Thunberg's toolkit, most of the time they don't have India's best interest in mind. And, and so now we will, we will dive into, you know, Ajay Bhai, the yeah, so, so, so the, the big item in uh, the big item in last couple of weeks has been that the Congress party in India uh, brought out its own toolkit. Now, at least that's what, uh, you know, we, we observed in the, uh, on Twitter, and that's what we read in the papers. Uh, you know, uh, who knows? You know, in anything that on on Twitter, who put out what? But um, you know, there's, there's certainly it is very consistent with the stand that Congress has taken. So, um, if you were to really, you know, uh, look at all the statements that the uh, Congress and the opposition leaders have made in India, and you kind of you know match it with the toolkit that they put, uh, that was uh, you know. Uh, that was exposed on Twitter, you would think that, you know, you would, you would, you would say that this, this looks, you know, certainly reasonable that this toolkit origin uh, to a uh, toolkit, uh, you know, regardless of what the origin was on Twitter, the toolkit certainly uh, is a playbook by which the uh, people who don't like Hindus have played by in India. So for example, um, I, you know, I think I think so that you said that you know uh, Churchill once said that never let a good crisis go to waste, right? And in opposition party uh, took this up as an opportunity to uh, you know beat up the ruling party, which is natural. But the way they did it, so opposition parties have a duty in some sense to oppose, um, you know, except when it's really impacting the uh, impacting your country impacting the health and lives uh, lives of the people who live there in, in good faith opposition is always a good thing but this one exceeded a bit uh, a good faith opposition and it almost was as if that this was an attempt to see if you can use the kind of activism that was used in the arab spring and use this crisis the covid crisis that we have talked about in the on this show in past use this crisis to somehow, uh, you know, engineer a regime change in India against Modi. So that, you know, it seems, it seemed to me and seemed to a lot of people that this was an attempt at regime change. And uh, Twitter, uh, we'll come to the, the social media role in more detail, but uh, it was almost as if Twitter itself was playing a part in making sure that uh, you know uh, the opposition in India got all the help it needed, um, so so that why don't you take us step by step, and I'll put it up on the screen, step by step to the uh, to uh, you know through this uh, toolkit as we saw on Twitter, and it starts you know not surprisingly from Kumbh Mela because. Hindus are an easy target and you can, uh, you know, even though there are so many such events of farmers agitation and all the other things going on, but what, about, what better place to start uh, than a gathering of Hindus, right? So let me share the screen and please walk us through it. So, you know, the Congress toolkit and, and both, both the Congress party and many people who support the Congress party on social media and have direct links to it have tried to say that this is something that was not 
fully accurate and there, there was you know there were counter acquisition obviously and we you know we can we can agree that you know these things happen on social media and there is never a hundred percent accuracy in terms of confirming what part is accurate and what part is not but what is accurate is that we can actually measure and cross check the statements that were actually made by leaders in, in the opposition in India and some of the points that were in the toolkit. And, uh, you know, one of those points being that when the second wave of COVID hit uh, and, and it, it hit India really badly, India is still reeling under the, under the tragic consequences of this second wave. Uh, the concerted a concerted effort was actually made to try to promote the fact that this gathering of hindu pilgrims was called the kumbh mela and, and obviously most hindus who are watching this uh, show know what kumbh mela is for those who don't it's it's one of the largest gatherings of hindus in northern part of the indian subcontinent uh, where people gather to you know take bathe in the rivers and 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 pay their obeisance uh, so the just to add actually if you in, in normal times in non covid times kumbh is the largest gathering largest gathering of human beings anywhere in the world that's that's mahakumbh uh, ajay bhai so mahakumbh, it's yeah. yeah so that's and, that's and that a, was not what was happening mahakumbh every four years the mahakumbh that happens um that is the largest one Correct. Right. This is so one this, of the, this was not a Mahakumbh Mela. It was not was that not actually right. it was right. not that big of a gathering either. But right. Uh, right. the a concerted effort was made that I mean I I really looked at the number of gatherings that happened throughout India on Friday prayers in mosques, and if you really put together some of the large mosques that have Friday prayers and continue to have Friday prayers in many places during the height of COVID. Uh, uh, covid second oh, there was a farmer's agitation right but, correct I, i'm uh, getting there. i'm getting there i'm getting there everywhere that. and right now actually in the places where farmer's agitation was uh, took place has the highest covid uh, if you go to haryana and uh, the western part of up and uh, punjab uh, the covid cases there are uh, the highest i really found out that there there were far more people gathering every friday in mosques around india then that were gathered in uh, at the kumbh mela venue and concerted efforts were effort was made by the congress toolkit uh, as we found out later to promote the messaging that the best way to target prime minister modi and india's so called hindutva uh, narrative is to promote the fact that kumbh mela gathering was the reason that the second wave hit so badly not true but that was a, that effort was made and media around the world not just in india i mean there is a big section of the india indian media that is very anti modi that had always been anti modi for for the last 20 years but that is you know that's a, that's acceptable because you know in any country you don't expect media to be always supportive of one party or one ruler uh, of that party but there was a global effort you know around the world media like new york times washington post push two two main narratives that the second covid wave in india happened because of kumbh mela and to show persistently cremation of hindus who are who were getting you know who passed away during covid it was to the point where there was no pictures of covid available out there except cremation pictures and and indians would be paid huge sums of money to put a camera on drones just so that they can take videos of cremations so this was a very concerted effort that was done and you have to understand that cremation is something that is very very theologically very very alien and and disliked by christians and muslims around the world because it is theologically very antithetic to their to their religion and that's why it it has this uh, you know almost a uh, for lack of a better word and i i'm really sorry to use this word but a spectacular quality to it that they want to cash on and and show people so that's why it was so important for them to show cremations because it was an enabling tool for othering the hindu community not just in india but around the world and so so the what you know what uh, you know what is really stinging to most hindus is weaponization of hindu words so you remember last year when we were talking about uh, 
you know, wholly against Hindutva. So you take the Hindu festival, uh, an auspicious Hindu occasion, and you weaponize it. And here they're doing that same thing with Kumbh. So for example, super spreader Kumbh. Uh, this is taking a Hindu, uh, you know, an auspicious Hindu event and weaponizing it against Hindus around the world. So okay. and, uh, these and, are the kinds of words that are, I, these are not even dog whistles. So that these are, uh, these, these are the sticks to beat, beat Hindus with. That, hey, look, uh, you are a super spreader. Your, your festival is super spreader. Now go out and defend it. Right. And, but when it comes and, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, that worked. I had so many Americans come to me and say this, that, hey, why are, why are Hindus having religious festivals with thousands of people gathering when you are going through this, this humongous uh, second wave that, that is you know, causing so much trouble to the people of India? People came yeah. and asked me that. And I'm like, okay, uh, but actually the places where the second wave is happening at its worst are places where very few people even probably went to the kumbh, and there was nothing. They had nothing to do with the kumbh uh, yeah. gathering. And in fact, you know the, the correlation, you know, as I, I say, I would say tonight yeah. now, is actually with the farmers' protest. And yeah. in it was found out that most of the people in uh, Delhi who were, who got COVID in the last one month, actually sixty percent, more than sixty percent, the COVID came from a, a variant that originated in what is. Punjab, which is from where the farmers were, quote, the quote unquote farmers were all coming from for protesting and blocking streets of, of Delhi. So I think if there is any correlation, it was the farmers protest, which was a super spreader event. But and it's going to start again, mind you, Ajibai, because now the cases in Delhi have gone down and, and they, there is little bit of respite from the emergency that is that, you know, literally sieged the population for the last one month. And the farmers protests are starting again. And if it, this is not something that people in India can can find correlation with, then I'm sorry, but you know, Congress toolkit really worked. But coming back, so, you know, yeah, yeah. As so, just on, uh, you know, on on that, right? Uh, you had people, uh, you had non-Indians. I had so many Indians, uh, you know, and with Hindu names come to me and say, "Look, it was all because of Kumbh that the second wave started." So there's a big, you know. But if you look at the, if you look at number D here, uh, it says. Uh, our non-party office bearers and supporters can be encouraged to use social media posts to highlight by carefully using pictures that Kumbh is uh, shown. Uh, Kumbh is a show of political power in the name of religion, where while Eid gatherings, because Eid was a couple of weeks ago, Eid gatherings are happy social gatherings of families and communities. And so the, this is, uh, you know, again, uh, we are thinking, we are not talking about India here. We're talking about from the American perspective. And from American perspective, the image that create, gets created, because these are the things that get reported in New York Times, they get reported to Was uh, you know, Washington Post, that get reported to all the, by major press agencies, whether they are AP or uh, you know, Reuters and other agencies, and the image it get, ends up creating of India, uh, the Hindu India, is this uh, people who are, uneducated, ignorant, and uh, who go around, uh, you know, uh, spreading, you know, uh, who have no knowledge of these infectious diseases and, you know, engage in activities that promote it. And Congress succeeded, in, at least when it came to the Western media. The next uh, next part that you have slide that you have uh, selected is uh, about Prime Minister Modi's event. And I, I know this is an interesting one, right? Because uh, Prime Minister Modi was not allowed to come to America for several years after the uh, Godra, you know, burning of train where Hindus were uh, massacred, who were traveling at the train and the riots that followed and all of that. And then uh, India and then uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, became quite popular in America because he had, you know, he developed very good relationship with President Obama. And he continued this good relation he had with President Obama, with, to pres with President Trump. There were three uh, Howdy Modi events that took place. And, uh, you know, all of these events, uh, you know, uh, uh, two, one was Howdy Modi, in, uh, uh, one was in California, a similar event with a different name, and one was in New York City. So three big uh, mass events that took place in America. And there's this, uh, you know, a very strong support base that Prime Minister Modi has in America among Hindus. 
And we even, uh, you know, we even talked about a survey which actually validates that. Now, despite of this, uh, despite of uh, despite of this crisis, the prime minister's ratings, uh, approval ratings, have not gone down in India, and they've not gone down in America. It's uh, pretty much the same, because his government and him are tirelessly working uh, to make sure that you know they do the best they can in making uh, you know uh, with the limited resources in terms of the starting materials for vaccines or amount of oxygen available amount of number of hospital beds available so all these you know uh, you know uh, you know tireless effort has you know has resulted in prime minister's rating uh, approval rating not going down so what does this toolkit talk about so that when it comes to prime minister prime minister's image So that you're on mute. Yeah. So well, it, well, you know, the, as you can see on the screen, it it basically focuses on uh, how to make sure that Prime Minister Modi actually gets hit with the second wave's uh, public uh, distrust and public grievance. And and you know what what was most interesting is that if you know, look point number C, you know use of dramatic pictures of funerals and dead bodies, which is already being done by foreign media. So they are asking journalists to be facilitated by local Congress party cadres to take dramatic pictures of, uh, of uh, cremations, to, of bodies. Uh, we, there was even information that people were digging up uh, bodies from graves and throwing them in rivers to make it look like people are throwing bodies in the river. So. So this is something that that really should bother uh, people around India, because if a political party is go willing to go to the extent of even disrespecting dead people and people who have passed away, you know, in, in most Western countries, people have laws that protect their privacy when they pass away. And and please excuse my my daughter speaking in the back. She's uh, She's 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 starting to talk now. So now we have background uh, music as I speak. So you know it, it was it's really tragic that in Western countries there are rules and regulations that prevent these media from showing private uh, private uh, you know funerals. But in India, because you know obviously India is is othered and Hindus don't deserve that privacy. Uh, in the minds of the Western media. And at the end of the day, their only and sole goal is to destabilize the country and get rid of you know, leaders they don't like. They will show as much as possible, as many dead people they can, and in as brutal and, and, and you know, aggressive ways as they can. And as you can see from the toolkit, that was exactly that was done. I'm sorry, we went to a wrong slide for some reason. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me get back to this slide that you were talking about, Utsada. I think something, uh, uh, you know, for some reason we jumped this slide. Uh, let me uh, let me see if I can go back to the slide you were talking about. Uh, yeah, I think somehow you, you something got deleted. You del uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I retrieved them. Not to worry. We are a we are a we are a friendly uh, friendly show here, so it, it things happen, <laughs> uh, and then they did. So here we are back. Uh, back to the slide. Correct. No, so th that's the point. I mean, as people can read, you know, the, their main effort was, was to attack the Prime Minister of India. And, you know, the use of the word regime itself is a toolkit. Uh, to, it's a toolkit term. So, you know, it's the word regime basically the, came up again during Arab Spring. Right? Correct. So the use of the word regime was basically uh, a toolkit term that was developed in the 2010-2011 Arab Spring movement, uh, because that's how you delegitimize uh, leaderships and, and and governments in countries, uh, and it probably was relevant in many cases in probably in in places in the Middle East because there were dictatorships with which indi with individuals having all the power, uh, so you could probably term them as regimes if you didn't like them. But obviously, these um, you know the same people would not term another dictator a regime if they like them. But in the case of India, it actually doesn't apply because Prime Minister Modi has actually gone through elections, not once, but twice. The largest electoral and democratic process in the entire world, not one, but once, but twice. 
And as people would agree, these are free and fair elections. These are not, you know, cooked up elections. You, you know, just last month, he, Prime Minister Modi's political party did not get enough seats to come to power in, in the state of West Bengal. If he was a dictator who ruled a regime, that shouldn't have happened because at the end of the day, you know, he was he could have controlled and changed elections. So in India, you have free and fair elections and to call the Modi government a regime itself is one of the biggest efforts at delegitimizing Indian governance and the people of India, most importantly. It's a, it's a and, and, and to the by people extension, of India. Uh, and by extension, Hindus and uh, people of Indian origin living outside of India. Because exactly. To, and and it, it delegitimizes everybody who is who stands for, for democracy around the world. You know, as it is, poorer countries in the world, you know, in, in to use American terms, you know, countries with people of color are delegitimized in mainstream media because there are few countries which are democratic. And India, which has upheld the, uh, the constitution and which has been a democracy without any dictatorship, without any military rule for the last 70 years, the most disrespect you can show to Hindus around the world and to Indians around the world is for yeah. mainstream media outlets like Washington Post and, 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 and New York Times and all these global uh, you know, mind framers to call Modi, a re Modi government a regime. And that, that, that is something that people in India to, should take very seriously. And that is something they should be punishing governments, uh, opposition parties like, like the Congress party in India for actually using this term. Just because so, you so, so the, lose election doesn't mean that yeah. the election is not, you know, <laughs> that is that is a very good sign of showing how, how much of a anti-India uh, opposition you are at this point of time. Absolutely. Uh, so, the, I, you know, I, let me, let me uh, 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 highlight a couple of things here, right? Um, so I wanted to highlight, Ajib, I wanted to highlight one more point before, you know, yeah, please, I wanted to use, uh, highlight the use of the term Indian strain and again, put it in a global. I was context. just going to come to that. So perfect. Go for okay. it. So, so <laughs> you're you more know, articulate than me. So you go for it. So, so, you know, the term, the term Indian strain uh, was also used in the toolkit again to specifically target India and to specifically target Prime Minister Modi. In fact, if you see the last point of the toolkit, they are saying that try using the term Indian strain first so that it gets focused on India in the global media and then see if you can use and get away with the term Modi strain. And, and actually it's journalists started using the term Modi strain. There was a, there's a journalist called Sonia Falero, who is a very anti-Modi, very anti-Hindu uh, uh, journalist, a big journalist, uh, a, a, a daughter of a big Congress leader from Goa. Sonia Fellow actually used the word Modi strain. And, and this was deliberate, as you can see in the toolkit. And it was to test people's acceptance on how far they're willing to go. And, and the funny thing is that in the entire world, there has been a movement in the last one year to make sure that no country gets tagged with any COVID strain. In fact, America actually made legislations just last week so that people cannot use the term China strain, even though COVID originated in China, or China virus, or Wuhan virus, the, those terms actually were delegitimized in America and around the world so that people don't get discriminated on the basis of where the COVID's, COVID strains originated. And here you have the biggest opposition party in India making a toolkit. Obviously, you know, global media outlets, quote unquote, liberal media outlets who have huge problems calling it China virus picking up the term India strain, Indian strain. And they had no problem speaking up uh, the term uh, South African strain either, because, you know, obviously South Africa is another place where you can get away with anything. So you can go and make them look bad. So it's, it's a very, you know, uh, yeah. hypocritical yeah, you know, way that uh, liberals know, around the world operate, or I use the word liberals in quotes and their media yeah. friends operate. And Congress actually did this. They, they institutionalized the term Indian strain in their toolkit and then they even are attempting to make it a Modi strain. So imagine, imagine the next step that they're going to. Uh, it is a Hindu strain, right? The yeah. next step is Hindu strain. Uh, that will come at a global level. Congress will not do that. Will come Congress at a global knows level. that but India is still me, a Hindu majority country. Let me just say country. this. Uh, to your point, let yes. me just say one thing. Last week, a few people uh, around the world used the word Singapore strain. And Singapore government actually came down really heavy, hard 
on the people who use the word Singapore strain, because this is how you, uh, uh, you know, castigate one country. And again, people used to associate, there was a legitimate naming convention uh, bef- uh, to name the virus or strain or, or, or a virus based on the geographic origin. But as soon as the uh, virus, this particular COVID-19 strain became uh, prevalent, uh, China, working with World Health Organization, other countries came together and said, do not associate the virus strain with geographic uh, location. There was, a, there was an agreement there to not use this correlation, connect, connection, what do you call it? And here it is, an Indian political party, supposedly a, a national opposition party in India, actually associating the virus with the name India. Uh, I don't know how a, a party that uh, w- seeks to uh, ho- you know gain power in India uh, maligns India on a global uh, stage and then still can uh, go back to its own people in India and say we want to be your representative. How can they do that in good faith? I want to I want to uh, point out a couple of other things, Soda. Um, I think you've already mentioned uh, the dramatic pictures of funerals and dead bodies. Um, you, uh, there's also this other one where it says, international media coverage by foreign correspondents in India can be tailored exclusively to focus on Modi and his mismanagement. Now, not just the uh, journalists, Sada. Last week, uh, a prominent American academic with the Hindu sounding name actually uh, you know, conducted a, an informal survey, one of those Twitter surveys. And uh, he wrote an article first, which said that who are the five leaders at the global scale who uh, mismanaged the COVID crisis? Okay, I don't want to legitimize this person by giving his name or put a reference to his article. But this is a prominent Indian Hindu American academic in America who actually wrote an article about five global five world leaders who mismanaged the covid crisis he put modi at the number one position and then he put it out for a poll and on twitter poll as you can imagine with you know all twitter being manipulated in one way or the other uh, 90% of the people when i checked the poll last said modi is the worst crisis manager for covid crisis now, you see the dichotomy here, also the Modi's rating is not going down because people in India, where, where he is the prime minister, thinks that he is doing his best. Someone sitting in America, in the ivory tower, puts out an article that he is mismanaging the crisis in the worst possible way. And all the minions on Twitter uh, who are manipulated by uh, various countries and uh, their uh, intelligence agencies and uh, all the left cabal uh, that belong to India and they send out uh, they send out these tweets and enter the you know and vote in the poll most of it probably even you know uh, robotic polling and say look Modi is the worst crisis manager in an or in an attempt to build this anti Modi anti India anti Hindu narrative okay. So this is how the toolkit journal uh, toolkit activism is evolving now. So journalists. Well, well, the funny part is that the same people actually, when India got hit by the first wave, which was actually much much milder compared to the global uh, COVID crisis that emerged last year, in 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 summer, uh, and later on a little bit in in winter. This they had the same narrative also last year before the second wave hit. So yeah. even when India was doing really well in COVID management uh, and given its population last year, it was actually, it, 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 that's one of the reasons why the second wave hit so bad because most people in India thought that Indians are not, uh, you know, Indians will not be affected by COVID because it did so well in managing the first phase of COVID uh, crisis. Even at that time, the same people were making a list of the worst COVID managers in the world and it was still Modi on the top of the list. I still remember that. So, <laughs> so when there was good, amazingly good management last year, that led many people in India to you know, actually take down their guard and, and cause this really bad second wave. 
that time also modi was the worst covid manager in the world covid crisis manager in the world and after the real second wave hit which was actually really bad and it was hitting most of the states that were not even ruled by the modi uh, you know the political party that prime minister modi belongs to there it hit those states the worst where the opposition party was in power but even then modi is the worst uh, uh, covid so, manager so let's talk a little bit about the frontal congress organization if you want to just summarize this slide before we go to the next one uh so so no i i just think that you know this whole toolkit activism that keeps emerging again and again in india uh points to something very real and something very uh, unfortunate which and is sinister that, actually it, it, it is, it is very sinister. sinister it is very sinister which is that there is a global effort being made to make sure that india fits into this narrow world view of the world especially the powers global powers that are interested in india and that world view is that india should remain what it was in the last 70 years when it was a third world country with a huge market with enough buying power to actually be a, a market for the global uh, powers that be but with not enough political will and geopolitical strength to be a, a force to be reckoned with and any effort by a leader like modi to take india to that next level of self reliance of 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 uh, of economic uh, muscle and of uh, of you know civilizational identity that can take india away from that third world you know market you know global market kind of uh, of country is going to be opposed is going to be changed and it's go, you know and that is why the the modi government faces so much destabilization effort at a global level and so you know, let's talk a little bit about sam javed well she she is uh, you know again she was the author of the toolkit and somehow it seems that she's also part of the effort that was made by certain uh, fact checking organization i put that in quotes because many of the times these so called fact checking organizations are actually part of the toolkit activism itself so sam javed is one of the authors of the toolkit and it somehow also is one of the people who is part of the fact checking group that is saying that the toolkit was not right and it's it's a propaganda effort by the modi government and its, its supporters so you can see the connection you know you you have at the back end the same people doing the propaganda and then saying that you know you know the other side is doing the propaganda and what is actually propaganda is you know is a, is a game by the other side so you know it's it's a very complicated murky effort uh and we are going to continue to see this globally because yeah social media is something that is going to increasingly become a tool for uh, you know changing people's opinion misguiding people it is the next generation of warfare like misinformation disinformation is the next generation of warfare in which everybody is now part of and it it frames public opinion and it is important for hindus to understand that it's important for hindus to understand and and resist it because otherwise yeah. you know we will just remain uh, useful idiots at the hands of many of these global players so that let me go to uh, a little bit role of this role of the social media in maligning the hindus when the toolkit activism uh, takes uh, you know this prominence right you see this twitter's attempt to shield congress over toolkit controversy exposes us regime change operation against modi the reason this headline with sada is because the person uh, sambhito patra who uh, posted the toolkit um when he uh, you know when he tweeted about it his tweet was labeled as manipulated media by twitter okay uh that is so, so twitter is now at, uh, passing a judgment on whether the news is fact or not based on who knows what because certainly twitter does not have a an a, you know an unbiased view as we have seen from past uh we know that uh, twitter um, you know uh twitter we uh, you know twitter is an active participant in a lot of things that are anti hindu uh starting with you know the way uh jack dorsey when he was in india was holding the uh, you know politically motivated uh, slogans um, and uh, he got you know uh, that he had no business no understanding of uh and here he is 
and here is twitter uh, taking a legitimate uh, you know political party spokesperson's tweet and labeling it without actually disproving there's no uh, th- without actually there's absolutely no one has actually come out and said that this toolkit is fake twitter is exercising its own judgment so so the uh, you know this should be a part of a larger conversation that we should have but really the promise of internet was that the free sp- that internet will promote free speech internet will unshackle the ordinary people from the commercially controlled or mass uh, or government controlled media and ordinary people will now have a voice and here is twitter now curtailing becoming the government becoming a monopolistic uh, commercial entity becoming a judge of what is right and what is wrong and whose free speech should be honored and whose free speech should not be this to me so the is a legitimate civil liberties issue and somebody at some point um we should talk about it in much more detail and hold these kinds of monopolies over free speech accountable because if not we are now transcending into a world where no uh, legitimate uh, freedom of speech will exist that is correct and you know if i may go out on a limb and say this by 2024 when the next main big national general elections in india come up you will see much more of this you will literally uh, have direct intervention of social media giants you know in in national elections in india that will be trying to delegitimize uh, either prime minister modi's government or anybody who wishes to replace him from his political uh, party so th- i can assure you that that's going to happen in 2024 that is exactly where this is heading and i think people in india need to know and, and understand it from now on itself and it has been attempted in other parts of the world as well uh, in many cases it works because information is the next uh, you know disinformation is the next uh, theater of war and that is going to happen in 2024 during the general elections in national I, elections i know in india. so that i can tell you that um, that will not work in india for multiple reasons they can try but the kind of grassroots level campaigning and work that happens in india and um, you know the the way the judicial system and the political system is set up in india um that kind of uh, influence the social media uh you know has in some of the other countries is not going to be uh, you know is not going to be possible in india just my view will will wait for it to unfold uh, so that i i want to close this topic out by talking about the toolkits impact on hindus in america so i'll start with one and then i'll turn it over to you i think uh, some of the imp- uh, one of the biggest impact is that here are hindu organizations like vhp america like seva international they are all trying to uh, you know uh, Uh, you know garner resources collect donations and really trying to help people in india when these kinds of uh, news items concerted negative reports about india come out i think that impacts this fundraising and that impacts um, you know uh, that impacts what people feel like doing because people say ah, these people are careless they are gathering for religious gathering and all these hindus don't understand it doesn't matter what i donate right so it it weakens the relief effort that is so needed right now i also think with so that that this is this is the kind of emotional manipulation of people that is meant to weaken the tie between hindus who live in america and hindus who live in india and this weakening tie will end up not only it breaks the tie between uh, between the hindus uh in and uh, the support they have for each other and all of that but it also weakens the attachment that hindus have towards their uh, punya bhumi which is india and then the political opponents of india the countries who don't like india the communities that don't like india they now can uh, get anti india legislations in us pass much more easily so this because now they have weakened the opposition to uh, people hindus in america 
who are supporters of India. So that is the other thing. It also perpetuates the image of Hindus as people who are poverty stricken, undereducated, uneducated, ignorant, and whose stock in life is always to be this miserable suffering people. You know, the extension of what kind of portrayal that a British colonialist or even before that Islamic colonialists had uh, made of India. And that image of Hindus means that every Indian kid who goes to a school in America, every Indian who is working uh, of Hindu origin, uh, every Indian, uh, every Hindu of Indian origin who is working at a, at a you know, large corporation or a small corporation is looked upon as this, you know, strange being who is, you know, uh, who, uh, who is, you know, this uh, uneducated, ignorant person and, uh, you know, who is, uh, you know, who is lesser than uh, other people in the community. I think these are the kinds of things that are, the, so the reason so that we spend so much time on the toolkit today is not because that toolkit is going to have a huge impact in India itself, but the adverse impact that the toolkit has on Hindus in America. So that, what do you think? As you pointed out, there, there is an adverse impact and uh, you can see the adverse, adverse impact on Hindus in America because now you can see an entire generation of Hindus who are growing up in America being fed on this propaganda that is inaccurate and that makes them really uh, feel less about themselves. It, because, you know, they, they always, people always relate to their heritage. And, uh, and their heritage, if their heritage is presented in a, in, with so much misinformation, with so much distortion, and, and with, with so much uh, negativity, this, this affects them and it, it affects other people who bully them in, in their... So, and this is why, you know, the, this is a different world now. And it affected the Japanese in World War II. A Japanese Americans were interned in camps. Because and and this the, what they what is happening with this toolkit uh, uh, misinformation is a so is a psychological version of that internment that, that is happening to Hindu Americans, uh, especially those who come from Indian origin. And you know, I noticed this in real terms. Two things happened with re regards to relief efforts. Organizations that don't have the best interest of India in mind were given more legitimacy because they would publicly target India and the government of India in their effort to raise money for those who are suffering during COVID. So they're achieving two things. They're raising money and they're also delegitimizing and targeting India at the same time. And they're getting money from average people because average people think that India is not doing, India is actually doing really badly and India doesn't deserve, the government in India doesn't deserve any help for this COVID, during this COVID crisis. And to be honest with you, that is very disingenuous because even today, as we speak, the worst COVID uh, environment in India that happened in the last two weeks parallels the worst that happened in America in January and February this year. This year in January and February, again, at that time, President Trump you know, was not in power. Therefore, it didn't make news because nobody could blame him for it. This year in February, America was losing more people every day than India was losing at its worst in the last two weeks. So, you know, it is, you didn't see global media outlets talking about it because it didn't fit the toolkit narrative. And, and, and you will continue to see all these organizations, I, and, and I, I could name many of them, but it's better that we keep them because they are they're still raising money. Right. Many of these organizations are actually going to use that money that they raised in the name of COVID to create unrest in India, to create uh, support terrorism in India. I will go out and say that because there are many of those organizations that actually are front groups of terrorist organizations, and and India will see far more violence and far more uh, you know delegitimization and targeted uh, misinformation in the coming months in the name of COVID relief. And the vice versa, there are organizations that were really doing real COVID relief work that were targeted in America because they are 
sympathetic towards what the government of India was doing to provide COVID relief. And therefore, they were delegitimized in America. And a very good example of that was Seva International. You know, despite being the biggest grassroots organization with the biggest grassroots level fundraising in America, there were institutionalized entities in America that were targeting Seva International because Seva International was, was not targeting the Modi regime as, as the toolkit uh, audio, you know, toolkit media would call it. So that, uh, with that, uh, let's uh, bring this topic to an end and let's go to the Hindu good news of the week. Usada, you are going to like this. You're going to like the title of this. The title of this good news of the week, Usada, is Namaste Alabama. <laughs> so, Usada, as you know, 30 years ago, uh, Alabama banned yoga in public school because it, uh, Alabama, in its infinite wisdom, thought that, um, you know, saying, uh, doing yoga in high schools, in schools, would make everyone a Hindu. Uh, so there was a legislation that came up this year where somebody, one of the, uh, one of the legislators said, Hey, you know, uh, you know, the world has moved on in 30 years. Everyone is doing yoga. 20% of American population has done yoga at one time or the other 10% population practices yoga every week or more than 10%. So finally, Alabama signed, an, uh, you know, Alabama passed the legislation that says you can do yoga and Alabama governor, governor, KIV uh, signed a bill to allow yoga in public school, but big but so that uh, they said that the, uh, you know and I'll read this the new law, yoga new law allows yoga to be offered as an elective for grades K twelve while it erases the ban that over the years some schools had not realized even existed. Okay, people just doing it. It also imposes restrictions on how yoga should be taught. Students won't be allowed to say namaste, for instance, and meditation will not be allowed. So that, I, you know, I, I think the only thing Maya really does really, really well among many others, but one thing that she has really mastered for ever since she was like four months old is doing namaste. And she'll go to a school in Alabama and she won't be able to do namaste. So what's going on here? And then uh, the other things that are not allowed are chanting, mantra, mudra, uh, use of mandalas, in, induction of hypnotic states, guided imagery, and namaste greetings shall all be expressly prohibited. It also requires English names to be used for all the poses and exercises. So only downward facing dog, okay? So that, nothing else, <laughs> no other name. <laughs> And before any, and, and no Surya Namaskar, it has to be sun salutation. And before any students try tree pose, so that keep this in mind because you have a daughter who is only a year, year and four months old, make sure that you give her specific permission uh, and a permission slip before she can try the tree pose. Okay, well, so that you got all that? Yes. Uh, you know, the thing is that at the end of the day, you can you can you can take a, you can try to dress up you know American uh, liberals and conservatives as being non-denominational non non uh, Christian fundamentalist but at the end of the day you know the reality shows up in places like Alabama the reason I think you know it is it is important that we address and understand the 80 pound gorilla in the room which is that, it, at the end of the day, the world sees yoga as a Hindu practice, and that is correct. And if the world sees yoga, yoga as a Hindu practice, it's a Hindu, you know, asanas, and you know, most of the world doesn't actually understand what yoga means. Uh, most of the world actually calls yoga what most Hindus would call asanas, and some would add pranayam to it. So, dhyana, pranayam, and asanas, these three you know, Hindu practices are pretty much what the world knows as yoga. And actually, I would be honest with you, most Hindus think the same way too. Most Hindus think just these three practices comprise what yoga means. And if somebody believes, and I think they are accurate in believing that, that Christians uh, will not go to heaven if they do yoga, 
they will try to ban it. They will try to ban Namaste. They will try to ban because these are real Hindu religious terms. So yeah, uh, they will try to ban it. The question is whether they should or not. And that's where Hindus in America have to take a stand. Would you want a, a, govern, a state government like that of Alabama to ban Hindu practices? If you believe that they should, then go with it. I actually am, I have no issues with, with what the state of Alabama did if they, if they actually believe that they are not going to go to heaven. A Christian is not going to go to heaven if they do yoga. And I believe they won't. So I have a very different position from you, Ajay Bhai. I believe but that, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't express my position here, dude. So I, I just no, no, but you were You were critical of what Alabama did. No, no, no. I just read the news item. Come on. I, you know, I just read it in a light way. And I just said, look, I mean, I'm just going to go to Alabama. And, you know, I lived in Mississippi for a long time. So I and visited Alabama many, many times. So I just go to Alabama now and just say, Namaste, Alabama. That's all. I, I'm not saying anything else. Well, I, yeah. You know, so, so, yeah. I, so all I'm going to say is that that is the reality of Christian theology and whether that should be the case in an American political and social setting or not is the question. And that's where the, I, 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 th I think we should discuss this in more detail. The reason I say this with Soda is look, I mean, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are grievances in Alabama and other States about not displaying 10 commandments in the classroom. And there are other, you know, uh, that, you know, are not saying prayers during football game and things like that. So, I think, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, to some extent, this is, an, uh, you know, a reaction to that as well. And I think there are legitimate arguments to be made. Um, I just I just found this to be, you know, uh, interesting that, you know, you know, that you cannot, you know, that namaste, which is, you know, uh, you know, a universal greeting, as far as I can tell from uh, Hindu, you know, just uh, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, you know, uh, in many, many different ways, uh, do namaste. And it is basically acknowledging uh, the goodness in the other people, divinity in the other people. But I understand that uh, theologically it may not be, uh, you know, other people may not see it that way. And so I think it, 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 deserves, a, uh, it deserves a larger discussion. On the other hand, don't you, know, you have to use English names for all the poses. That is laughable. I mean, you know, I can, I can see not saying namaste. I can see not allowing... Uh, you know, uh, not allowing meditation in a certain way, and uh, you know th those kinds of things I can understand, uh, or not doing mantras and japas, I understand that. But to say that oh, you shall use only English name for asanas, come on, really? Alabama can do better than that. So the reason I think that the reason it it brings us to a much more important topics that American Hindus need to understand, and that is un non translatables in Hindu you know, in Sanskrit and Hindu uh, religious terminology. The reason they are using uh, English words to present the Sanskrit, actual Sanskrit terms in yoga is because it delegitimizes Hindu identity of yoga. And it helps to make yoga. And again, I'm using the term yoga uh, as a generic term that for common people use. It's actually asanas, dhyana and, and, and pranayam. Uh, the reason these terms are used is because that's where the roots, it's, it's the honest part of being a practitioner of yoga. They're, 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 you know, they're trying to delegitimize that honesty and they're trying to make it one step further away from its original Hindu essence. And that's why they're trying to replace the terms with English terms because that's the first step to delegitimizing yoga as a Hindu practice. And the next step would be to make it a Christian practice, which has also happened in many parts of the world. This also happened. Yeah. So, so, so that we should do a And then, program. you know, the ironic yeah. part would be that after yeah. it, the entire delegitimization and then digestion had happened, has happened into Christianity, they will go to India and other parts of the world which, where there are dharmic civilization, Hindu, Buddhist, and all these practice civilizations. And then they will teach yoga as a Christian practice to them. And then people will <laughs> even drink it up, lap it up even more because now it's a Western Christian practice. So think about that. So that with that, uh, let's acknowledge at least the good news. Alabama, you can now in school, you can do yoga uh, without, acting, without using any Sanskrit names, except one. Yoga, a Sanskrit name will still be 
you you can still say yoga in a school even though that word itself is a sanskrit word trust me it will also change eventually that like somebody will bring up uh, you know once this this sli- steady slide happens they will turn it into uh, you know utsada unnatural celebrate. human calisthenics Utsoda. or something like that utsada <laughs> celebrate for a second celebrate don't worry about it today I, enjoy I'm today celebrating. i don't have any issue i, I you get too serious all the time thank you no, no, that's just for just, just something you like to say because say, you are less thank, serious than me <laughs> thank a thank alabama for recognizing one sanskrit word at a time today's sanskrit word that alabama has recognized is yoga and we need to thank alabama and we need to acknowledge the alabama for recognizing the word yoga while not recognizing any of the asanas as sanskrit words so now with that we go once again to hindu seva charity act of the week and here is our song Manasa satam swarniyam Manasa So once again we continue to raise funds as VHPA for covid relief I am glad to report that so far VHP America has raised close to 1.65 million dollars for covid relief uh, we have raised the funds for two kind of multiple activities and uh, we certainly want to acknowledge all the people who have uh, you know, who have donated the money i would urge people uh, to go to um, to go to our website vhpamerica.org and click on the donate button and make a contribution so the so here's the screen i wanted to show you all the activities that we as vhpa have done uh and by the way this is our newsletter that people can actually go and subscribe to and you can see that we have done you know we send out regular monthly newsletters and this one just went out today uh it has some information about anjali ben that we mentioned in the show by the way so that before i i do want to talk about that also but here you can see the vhp chicago that sent out this large military grade oxygen concentrators were three of them worth a million dollars um we also have uh, and there's a nice write up on that on our website and also in this newsletter uh the aviation minister of india hardeep singh puri actually acknowledged the contribution by world in the council of america or vhpa and these were sent to different parts of india they landed in amdavad one was in gujarat one went to uh, nadia i believe in gujarat and third one i'm trying to remember where it went but we can get the details are on our website uh so that then this is the uh really a very interesting uh you know unique kind of uh, programs that vhp america is supporting uh, to the tune of 165000 um as you can imagine with any crisis uh, of this magnitude um there is you know uh, you need wood for creation because electro- electrical the uh, crematoriums are running at capacity and uh, you know cutting down trees has environmental impact so vhp america is uh, supporting this respectful farewell to the departing soul in an environmentally friendly ecological ecologically sustainable way and uh, these are the uh, cow uh, log mach- uh, these are the machines that create logs from cow dung and this has the impact of uh saving uh the you know in a sustainable way saving the cows from slaughterhouse on one hand on the other hand uh it also uh creates an environmentally friendly fuel uh for cremation and nobody wants to talk about it it is you know it is not a pleasant thing but you know we we want to make sure that the cremations are respectful and at the same time they're eco- ecologically sustainable a lot of research has gone into this um by you know by various organizations in india and we continue to support it so that i want to go to these are the uh, you know uh, some of the activities that vhp india has the vhp america has done to support covid um, you know relief in india you can see that uh, you can see our call to action here are the summary uh, you know we have donated uh, 238000 dollars 225000 oxygen concentrators the smaller ones 
um, eighty-five thousand donation for the creation project from VHP National. Others from other sixty-five thousand or more, uh, uh, with ninety-six thousand in pledges from Support a Child program, which itself is uh, funded through uh, generous donations. But from that money, we've been able to uh, give uh, from the savings some money for COVID relief where children are impacted. Uh, again, a thousand units of oxygen concentrators through that program. Um, you can see uh, the even our chapters, and I'm just listing one. There are multiple ones, but you can see that even chapter in Florida is uh, contributing to the to the COVID relief. Also, that I want to point out a couple of programs that VHPA is doing. Our Chicago chapter is opening now. The registration is open for Ch uh, Chicago Bal Vihar. So. Uh, People who have little kids who are interested, please go to uh, the uh, balviharchicago.org website, click on the register button and, uh, subscribe and, and sign up your kids. A Hindu pack slash American Hindus Against Defamation program today, Utsada, in the evening, uh, in partnership with Dharma Civilization Foundation or DCF. This is an AHAD initiative on Hindu dvesha or on Hindu phobia. Uh, we are doing this program in partnership with the Jewish Federation and the Holocaust Resource Center of Keene University. Uh, what can Hindus learn from the Jewish Holocaust? What can Hindus learn from the Jewish Holocaust? The program is at 7 p.m. Eastern, at 7 p.m. Eastern, at, um, uh, and it's on uh, the registration information is on our website at hindu hindupack.org. Um, we urge you to come and join. There's actually a Holocaust survivor uh, who is going to be speaking at this event today. Uh, it's a very pertinent topic um, in light of what happened in Middle East. Um, it also is a very important topic for Hindus in light of what is happening uh, in uh, in Kashmir, in West, in Bangladesh, in Kerala and all the other, in Pakistan and all the other places, what can Hindus learn from the Jewish experience? And again, this is in partnership with DCF, it's part of our Hindu Dvesha or Hindu Phobia webinar series, today at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and the registration information is on our website. You can also watch it in the same place you're watching this particular show on all of the VHPA's social media channels. And with that, Utsoda, we come to the very final segment of our show today. And as always, the most anticipated segment of the show. And that is Hindu Phobe of the Week. Utsoda, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you need a good, a good music for that, right? So here we go. Usada, announce for us, as I put it up on the screen, announce for us the Hindu Phobe of the Week because you do it so well. The Hindu Phobe of the Week this week is uh, basically, you know, a bunch of uh, missionary organizations who have used the COVID-19 crisis to actually try to con con convert people and and you know i'm not the one who is less serious here my daughter is the more, one who is more upset at this time so uh, <laughs> there there have been uh, there have been you know so many news items out there that talk about how you know as, as winston churchill said the, no crisis should go to waste and you know we saw no, this so the, these people people who take advantage of people who are in desperate situation in a crisis situation due to these kinds of crisis are basically gutter dwellers okay they want to well, go well to you know gutter. it is a lesson that should have we should have learned and we should have, should have learned many times over uh, and, historically and by the because, way i did not coin this uh, phrase this this is a phrase that was uh, this was the phrase that was coined by mahatma gandhi that these are people who are gutter inspectors and these are the people who go uh, to gutter and uh, do uh, basically the dirtiest uh, possible deeds. They they go there instead of doing selfless service. Look at Sada, we started the program today by talking about what? We started the pro talk about life of a person who did selfless service to the community, a selfless leader. And look, where are we ending? A, 
a group of people who go around and say i will give you a little bit of money for food today if you adopt christianity this is this is what the this is the kind of world we live in today where instead of adhering to selfless service serving the society serving the community these are the people out there by any means by force fraud or inducement all they want to do is convert people nobody is against legitimately preaching and uh, you know having people uh, accept one religion or the other but when you go around buying people out of their traditions of their culture of their faith that is where the problem is and this is to basically take the cultural roots of the people and uproot them and this has been you know this is the kind of this is the kind of thing that never gets publicity you see all the people you see all the pictures of crematoriums with the bodies burning but you never see pictures of people being being given 50 rupees and 100 rupees and asked and, and and being asked to convert and you know so that was the worst part these are the people who take uh, you take hundreds of thousands actually millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars from their donors give 10 cents a dollar a 10 cents on a dollar actually gets transferred for this kind of activities 90% of the money who knows where it goes maybe in the private planes that some of these missionaries fly in and we end up you know uh we end up with conversion so the hindus have to have a response to this a much stronger response than they have had till so far this is not sustainable for hindus so you What know you this think? thing wasn't isn't something new uh it is very pandemic it it is you know pandemic it is actually the real pandemic out there and uh, it started in a very bad way during the tsunami that happened in 2003 uh, i think in in india and uh, you know the tsunami that ravaged all the indian ocean uh, country surrounding the indian ocean and in southern part of india these uh, missionary as you said vultures you know, literally descended uh, on the villages that were in the on the sea coasts and tried to do the same thing so every crisis for them is a crisis to be exploited every crisis for them is a crisis that can that will bring in revenue and donations from their followers around the world and this gives them an opportunity to to expand and this has its real geopolitical implications i mean if you look at many parts in the northeast of the indian subcontinent uh these groups actually support uh, armed terrorist groups and they they try and and you know in tripura for example for a long period of time hindus could not celebrate their religious festivals because these fundamentalist uh, christian organizations would uh, kill people for for celebrating their own festival uh, so this is something that has to be taken very seriously and every crisis any any other any part of the world you know this this kind of uh, you know missionary activism is extremely extremely in bad taste and it continues to happen it is happening in india as we speak and uh, i think hindus have to be vigilant everywhere and i think that's what you were trying to say when you when you gave that monologue on this and i think that what we have to be talking about more often thank you sada and with that uh, we come to the end of today's program it went quite a bit over sada we thought we didn't have a topic to talk about and here we are at the end of hour and a half but it was a really good topic i think a lot of people logged in today i was watching it so uh, thank you everyone for joining i think this is the kind of topic that interests everyone so thanks everyone for joining with soda um uh, thank you for all the hard work that you do week in and week out on uh, preparing for this uh, and uh, you know we'll we'll see everyone again next week this has been hindu lounge hindu lounge is brought to you by hindu pack which is the hindu policy research and advocacy initiative of world in the council of america we come live every week at 11 o'clock eastern on facebook on twitter on youtube and few days later on tag tv uh, with 
Utsav Chakrabarti, Utsav Da, who is our Executive Director of Hindu Pact. I am Ajay Shah, President of World Hindu Council of America. Uh, thank you and Namaste. Utsav Da, uh, final words before we go to the uh, out, 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 uh, outgoing music made especially for this show by Desi Bells. Thank you, Ajay Bhai. And uh, there is never a time when uh, we can stop talking. So every time we, pre we prepare for the Hindu Lounge show, halfway through the preparation, I tell Ajay Bhai, Ajay Bhai, we have enough material to talk for two hours. And Ajay Bhai persists because, uh, you know, we will we have a lot to talk about. So thank we are, you, everybody. We are all prepared. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Utsoda. And here we go with Desi Bells and a special music created just for episode number 55 of the Hindu Lounge. Here we go. Decibels, um, episode number 55 music. 